Precious Father, we thank you for Jesus, the one who has bridged the gap between us and yourself, whom you have given their Lord for that express purpose of bringing about humanity into your family. We thank you, dear Lord, for his wondrous work in so doing, for his humility, for your forgiveness, dear Lord, that tells us that you do not reckon our sins against us anymore, but you have thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness way behind your back, and we are free, free in Jesus Christ. Today, may your people truly experience and know that freedom that comes alone from believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Remember our families, remember our children. Above all, dear Lord, remember your work in the earth, the work that you have your hand on, that no man can mess up. May we cooperate with you then, dear Lord, in full surrender to the honor, to the praise of your glorious name. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. Has everyone a handout? Stefan is need for one or two, I suspect. Okay, let's get going. Our topic for this communion Sabbath is the mind of Christ and communion. And just now our scripture reading reminded us of what the mind of Christ is all about. All that we are craving for, longing for, praying for, the overtaking of us by that mind which esteems other better than itself, which is not natural to the wicked, evil human heart, the mind of Christ and communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29, I read, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had sucked, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye drink it, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The first uses of the emblems of the communion, the bread and wine, brought to view in the scriptures, sorry, brought to view in the sacred scriptures is found in Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Let us read this passage together. Genesis chapter 18, 14, sorry, verses 18 to 20. Can you find it in your Bibles and let us read it together? Okay, I believe that we should have it by now. Verse 18 to verse 20. Again, on the count of three, so we can be a unison. Two, three. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which have delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. This was a celebration of victory over the foes. And please notice 
how God's people celebrate victory. It was not merely eating and drinking, but eating and drinking the sacred emblems of the glorious victory achieved. What, the, what makes this even more distinct as a sacred and solemn service of thanksgiving, that is, of giving thanks, is the fact that Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, was present. Scripture says, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he it was that brought the bread and wine. And further, Abraham, the servant of the Most High God, offered his tithes to the priests of the Most High God. So watch what we're having here in this <coughs> essence. We're having the priests of the Most High God, the servant of the Most High God, and the Most High God in this whole issue. So what kind of celebration you think this could be? You think this could be a spring garden celebration, brethren? No, this was a solemn, sacred communion service, I dare say. Bread and wine as emblems of the victory of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about it? But something more intriguing as we get going. Notice that there was no feet washing ceremony involved. Ha. Ah. This indicates that there was no animosity, separation, divisions, etc., between the two representatives of the Most High God, but rather an oneness with God and with each other. I want to pause for emphasis there. There was no need of foot washing there because you're going to see that foot washing is for a particular purpose. The man, the, the, the priests of the Most High God and the servant of God were in perfect unity and unison, and there was the Most High God with them. Therefore, there was no foot washing. Wow. What is that saying to us? And we're going to see something as we go on, so I want to crave your attention to pay a little attention. I know some of you are not interested, but I want you to pay attention. The washing of feet is the acknowledgement of separation caused by envy and strife, which separates us from God and one another, our brethren, and must be put away. That's the first thing I want you to get. You wash feet because there is separation, division, as a result of envy and strife, which must be put away. We must therefore wash the feet of the ones from whom we are estranged or where there is a strained relationship. And today I want you to get it through your cranium very carefully. For washing is not about washing your friend's feet. It is washing the one who you are a variance, variance, strain, or estranged from. And we're going to see that clearly in the word of God. Too often, we rush and take out our friend's feet when we know there's somebody that has something against us or we against. That is not in the will of God. You see, brethren, communion is more grave than you imagine. And for washing, it is taken a new level by him who introduced it. I want us to get it today. And therefore, from now, begin to imagine who you are, quote unquote, some kind of difficulty with. That is the person you need to go, or else do not interfere with the emblems of the wine and the bread. But let us get going more directly. The object of the foot washing ceremony. The foot washing ceremony was designed by Christ to teach, among other things, two important lessons. One, forgiveness, and two, humility. Forgiveness, the first important lesson. The washing of feet is the acknowledgement of the contamination caused by sin and is indicative of the putting away of envy and strife which separates us from God and our brethren. This act is one of the most significant in the communion service 
because it says that having been forgiven and restored by our Heavenly Father, we have forgiven and restored our brethren who have trespassed against us. Thus, forgiveness is more than merely saying, I forgive you. But rather, it is to give for, that is, the giving of something for the wrong which was done to you. Forgiveness, therefore, is the act of restoring, renewing relationships, replacing confidence in the one who has done you wrong. That's what it's all about. And we're going to see him who is forgiveness embodied, his behavior. This is the level at which God functions. And those who have his mind, the mind of Christ, will similarly function. I can hear the soul behavior on this principle which is foreign to the natural man. But 1 Corinthians 2, 14 tells us, The natural man receiveth not the things of God, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually designed. Let us look at God's forgiveness. Do I hear a chorus of voices saying, we are not God? And correctly so. But we claim to be his children with the same DNA or life as he. And remember, that makes us just like him in character and behavior. You have the DNA of God, brethren. It must be seen manifestly. Humanity and Adam... Did, wrong, did God wrong. He took all that God gave him in trust and gave it to him, to his God's enemy, who then used it against God. Remember, it was not Adam's to give. But notice how God dealt with humanity and Adam. The first promise of God's forgiveness is found here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. You can repeat it with me. 15, sorry. And what? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his seed. Do you see anywhere in that scripture, God vexed or angry before Adam and Eve did? No, but in his inimitable style, which is his very nature, he offers them assurance, and forgiveness, praise the Lord. Do we still have the nature of Christ? How do we function? Do we function like our Father, or are we hard and overbearing for those who do us wrong or do the church wrong and therefore are not forgiven? I don't want you to check a fella. I want you to check yourself this morning. I do the same. I've done that quite a bit. We like to look at other people. For God's sake and your own safety this morning, brethren, look at your own self by the Spirit of God. In signs of the time, times June 27, 1900, states, the instant Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me, oh, praise the Lord. Not the behavior of God. They did it against God, and immediately God said, I found the sacrifice, and Jesus said, I will bear your punishment. How many of us bear the punishment of those who have done us wrong or who have done the church wrong? What is our attitude to those people? To keep them off with a long stick or to withdraw them with tender compassion as Jesus has drawn us who were away from him for a long time? This morning, brethren, the Spirit of God will speak directly. I know that. He has spoken directly to me. And therefore, I'm begging you, I'm craving you, brethren, not to check others, but check our own attitude, which is our mindset. Further, she says, 
let the punishment fall on me, Christ says, I will stand in man's place. Not that he did not say, you disobeyed me, we'll take that. No, I will stand in man's place. Give him what, brethren? Another trial. Are you willing to give anybody another trial? Or do you have to fall on the ground in front of you and do what you want done? Or is it they have fallen in front of Jesus Christ and he's forgiven them? Why are you hard-hearted telling me, he, she, or anyone else? Consider those thoughts, brethren. They are very important. Further, she, further it says, I will stand in man's place, give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the sentence of death. But in heaven, there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom, praise the Lord. He who knew no sin was made sin for a fallen man. So watch God's behavior, I say. He gave righteousness for sin, praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, praise the Lord. So you see, brethren, forgiveness is given for as is demonstrated and shown by God. He gave righteousness, Christ, for our sins, praise God. Do you know that type of forgiveness? That is the forgiveness that is in the heart of God, very the nature of God. And all those who have that nature, brethren, this is their behavior. This is the type of forgiveness they experience and share. But alas, alas, the human flesh. Oh, the apostle James says that the flesh warf against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary one to another. You can't get done what you want done. In Christ's brethren, it is done. And you say that is, and you say that is God. But let us look at persons who had God's DNA and see how they dealt with the offenders, even their enemies. Acts chapter 7, 59 and 60. You can probably read this one with me too. Let's go. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, don't get mixed up, children, with what the first verse is saying in Old English. All that is saying is, that Stephen called upon God, did what he did. It says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. That is, the people stoned Stephen while he was calling upon God to lay not their sin to their charge. Tell me something. We heard of what happened in South Carolina this week. We heard of people from the AME church. We went forward and said that the young man who perpetrated a crime that they have forgiven him. Isn't that fantastic? I am not judging people's motive. I can only hear what the people say. The nine members of the congregation was mowed down. The members of the family came forward and said, we have forgiven the young man. We have forgiven you, young man. What do I need further to say to get the point home? But don't we claim to be of a higher order like than many people? Do we operate that way even when the slightest thing is done against us or perceived to be done against us? But here are people, Christians they are. They are professing Christ and they say, we forgive you for killing our parents, our spouses, our children, whoever they are. It's not a fantasy fantastic response, brethren, to the honor of God. What will your response have been? I want the last ounce of blood. I want justice. That is what happens. But let's go further. Because 
justice has been meted out. Stephen gave them something in return for the wrong which they were doing to him. He asked that this thing be not chargeable to them. That is, he asked for the removal of their guilt and in its place pardon and freedom was given. That's what Stephen asked for, you know. Do not lay to their charge, meaning therefore they were, don't hold them guilty or culpable for this. He asked God to do that. And therefore, since he realized that forgiveness is given something for, he was being given death, and he was giving them forgiveness. Freedom, pardon, praise the Lord. It's all in scriptures, brethren. Freedom from condemnation of the heinous act. Their sin was punishable as all sins are. For all sin must receive the just recompense of reward. Listen to me. Whatever you sin you've done, it must be punished. But don't run along too fast. Follow me immediately. Where controversy, page 540, the 1880 edition says, The death of the spotless Son of God testifies that the wages of sin is death. That every violation of God's law must receive its just retribution. And that's an unerring fact. Every single sin must receive its just retribution. But I say to you, your sins have already received a just punishment in Jesus Christ. For you, brethren, there is no sin that you have done or that you cannot do that has not been paid for by Jesus Christ. You're not happy about that, are you? Or is it disturbing you that you have to forgive just as God has to forgive? Is that because it's somebody you don't want to forgive? I can't understand how God don't want me to forgive that person. Brethren, let loose and let go today. Don't be afraid. Fall on the rock and be broken. Rather than rock fall on your make you to powders. Let us today, brethren, take the high level on the God. On the God, I say. Not a figment of our imaginations, but follow God as he really leads us, brethren. No one has done anything worse to anybody than we have done to God. And he does not hold it against us. And if you have his DNA, you cannot, as a matter of fact, you will not because of him who dwells in you. I say further, I repeat, and since Stephen asks that the sin of his killers not be laid to their charge, it means Someone must be punished for it, and someone, Christ, had already paid a penalty for it, allowing them to go free, praise the Lord. But they didn't even realize that they were free because of Jesus. Again, another set of murderers. We are, doing the, we are dealing with the worst of the worst today. Your brethren have not murdered you. So if your murderers can't be forgiven... Who is your brethren that cannot be forgiven? If the murderers are forgiven, Stephen did it, and this other person did it. Who are you not to forgive somebody who just make a mistake or deliberately do what they did? Let's go. Luke 23, 33 and 34, the first part. And then when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, read with me that, brethren. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you think that they didn't really know what to do? What do you think, brethren? You think they didn't know what they're doing? Let's get sacred scripture. And I say here, and don't say that was Christ as if when he was in sinful flesh, he was different from us who are in the same sinful flesh. So don't bring that argument to me today saying that was Jesus. I say to you, brethren, he was in the flesh that we are in, and he functioned the way his children have functioned in the flesh that he was in because of his submission to his father. But they did not really know what they do. It is because the DNA of God was not in them that they did not know 
understand who the Savior was. No, my shift there immediately if you understand where I'm going. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Listen to what it says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So they did not know the mystery of God. They did not know the very love and the life of God. That is why they did what they did. But you today are without excuse. We claim to know the life and love of God. And therefore, if we continue holding each other as we do and not embracing each other as God for Christ's sake has embraced us, we will be just like them too as well, brethren. We cannot help but embrace those who have done us wrong. Because the life of God is in you, making you like God in behavior. Because the children of God, the children of light, has his DNA, they do not operate like the children of darkness. Sometimes you wonder who is children of darkness, who children of light, don't you? Yeah, sometimes those who claim to be children of light behave worse than the children of darkness. So in essence, like Christ once said, the publicans and the harlots were going to kingdom before you who are classified the children of the kingdom. So really the children of the kingdom, the publicans and harlots who have found the forgiveness and the repentance of Jesus Christ. So they are the children of God be careful, therefore, brethren, while pretending to be children of God, you are not, or we are not. You see, brethren, persons can only manifest the life that is in them. The truth is about it. You could only show up what is in you. That's why God and Solomon in one sweep says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person can't, like James would say, you cannot send for sweet and bitter water at the same fountain point. It can't happen. What is in you has to come out. And if Jesus Christ, brethren, his forgiveness is in you, that will come out to whoever offend you. That's the reality. And not only will it come out to, um, for who offend you, but you will large-heartedly forgive and embrace them. Not looking about thinking, supposed to do it again. That is the human nature. God didn't do that to us, and we did it over and over to him. Oh, wish they had time to deal with Peter. That's 70 times 7. We must see that God's forgiveness, that God is different from humanity. God is different, brethren. He is different from you. And if you're trying tra to make God you, I'm afraid of you. Do not do it. Let God be who he is. And let us under his spirit assimilate into his likeness. Rather than trying to put people in a mold that we think God would put them in. Let God deal with it, brethren. And he has dealt with it. Praise the Lord in Jesus Christ. Like I said, what is in you will come out. Whom you are will show forth. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Only those who are God's children have his DNA in them and can forgive the way he forgives. You think this forgiveness is an easy forgiveness? God alone must live in you to forgive the way he forgives. And I thank God for, because of Jesus that the Holy Spirit has come. The mind of Christ has been given to us. It keeps back our selfish self and gives the Father the opportunity in Christ to behave his way in our lives. That is the real deal this morning we're talking about. We're not talking about the Nambi Pambi thing we've done all, all the years. 
going to the one that is your friend, ignoring the one that you know you have against or has against you. And I'm speaking this as a worldwide experience to all those who consider themselves to be children of God. That is not God-like. It is not. I go further, repeating and go on on. Only those who are God's children have his DNA in them and can forgive the way he forgives. They give love for hatred, kindness for harshness, mercy for injustice, and forgiveness for unfairness. Those people in South Carolina have referred to them again. Family were cut down at a church service. And they were able to go and say, we've forgiven you, young man. I call that the higher order level of forgiveness, even God's forgiveness. And nothing to do with motive, you know, get there. Person confess it. We accept them, praise the Lord. This lesson of forgiveness, which the washing ceremony of a human service is designed to teach, is encapsulated in the following two texts. Very important. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, last part says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin. How much more? Come read that with me again, brethren. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin. You sure it's no more? It sure does. But also Hebrews 8, verse 12, the apostle here says, for I will be merciful to what? Their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember how much more? No more. Now let me tell you something. We can't have it cleaner than this. Your sin and iniquity, I not only forgive, but I ain't remembering it no more. Praise the Lord. Have you that experience in your life that you know you don't? Look, I, I have been real bad. I know. I've been terrible. But, you know, I am rejoicing night and day in all days that I have the assurance of God carousing my pardon. That is what inspires me as I keep on looking. Look at how God has dealt with all things. I might do some bad things. I tell you that. I'd be ashamed for you to know some of the things I've done. But I thank God he knew them and does not hold them against me. Praise the name of the Lord. And that is... the. You see why when people know, that's why Mary was forgiven so much, she could rejoice. And Simon, who did not accept the forgiveness, was angry at her. Think about it. When you are forgiven, you, uh, you know you're forgiven, might you feel good. Because it's not against you anymore. I thank God in Jesus Christ for that. Oh, brethren. The terms, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more, mean one and the same thing, which is, I will not hold your iniquity and your sins against you. They will not influence the way I treat you. Brethren, how do we treat people based on what they've done to us? Look, you, you get real. Don't, don't, don't try to hide up nothing now. You know that you like to look back on people's behavior towards you and say, uh-huh, you know what you do to me? Oops. Is that not your experience at some time? God is calling us to come on a little further. That is not how he function. I do not even allow the sin that the person has done to me to influence me in dealing with you. You know, not even the influence of it. But we have a long way to go, so I'm going to keep going by the grace of God. Going further. Likewise, God's children do not hold the wrongs done against them by each other or by their enemies. They are not influenced by the wrongs done to them. Matthew 5, 4, 3 to 4, for I love this. Read that italicized portion with me, church. I want you to be with me definitely. Let's go ye. Ye have heard that it have been said... Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate whom? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that what? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. The highest evidence of the character of God is right in this text, brethren. Doing good when wrong is done to you. That is the evidence that God lives in a man or a woman or a child. Let me tell you, it doesn't get higher level than this. You know what it is to forgive some person who has deliberately, calculatedly done something wrong against you and still continue to do it when you are forgiving them? Let me tell you something, brethren. We ain't much yet what God is all about. We talk a lot of fancy talk with character God. We don't have a clue about it because we don't experience it and demonstrate it to those who really are against us in a direct way. Even our family or relatives who are not against us, we hold things against them. Because she do so and so yesterday, she might do it again today. But this is the enemy, brethren. This church has to be awakened to come to a higher level. You talk about the character of God must stop and must be seen rather. So that when someone does something to us or to the church or to anything at all, brethren, you are large-hearted enough on the spirit of God to forgive that person as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. How can you stand back in historical hard-heartedness and think you are doing the will of God? Truly, Christ will have to say, as he said to John and those, you don't know what spirit you are of. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save. And keeping and being hard against a person, you are saying that you are trying to save them? Oh, for God's sake, don't mix up Christ with your nonsense, brethren. And let's be honest and firm with ourselves on the God today. That's why he said it's not about another father. Don't even check Austin. You don't hear me preach, blah, blah, blah. Don't even mind him. If you're doing it, God got his reward for him. So you make sure that your reward is safe, brethren. And for those on the internet, the same thing goes for you. Don't be disturbed by the other person. Make sure that under God, you receive his forgiveness, and his forgiveness allows you to forgive all those who have done wrong to you. But one may ask, somebody say they want some balance. I know the usual word. But one may ask, does forgiving mean I should return to a relationship in which I have been battered and abused over and over again? I answer just this way. Christ's words to his disciples are instructive here. Listen to Christ's words. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are not only to be harmless, but wise brethren. 